the technology that, that I think we'll have in, in, in the next 10 or 12 years. Let's start out with Moore's Law. So the, the, just the way I'm going to look at it is Moore's Law, then I'm going to talk about how we're going to get more performance, which will not be by, uh, by what we think Moore's Law will give us, how we're going to get more our lower power, uh, how are we going to create systems in the future, and then finally what are the development tools and how will they have, uh, be a part of our job. So let's start with Moore's Law. I, I find it interesting, if you go back to Moore's original paper, the mid-60s, you'll find that what he did is predict that we would be able to double the number of transistors we could integrate every two to three years. That was a prediction. Uh, being any kind of a good prediction, we made it mean all sorts of things. Uh, we, we believed it meant we could double performance every 18 months. Uh, well, what we found out is that performance, if you measure it by clock speed, and most of us chose to do that, actually fell off Moore's Law in the early 90s. And if you go back and do an architectural study of, uh, of uh, our microprocessors starting in the early 90s, you'll see that we started going deeper and deeper in pipelines, which is a good way to hide the fact the clock is not keeping up with you. And so our architectures now are very complex because we drove the clock as the important part and not the performance. So that's going to be changing over the next 15 or 20 years. But what we will find, and which I find interesting, and I, and I use it this way, it's kind of a little, little quip that kind of helps you understand. The only part of Moore's Law that will continue to be on Moore's Law is Moore's original law. We will continue to get more transistors. And in fact, what we will probably find over the next decade is it going from two, every two to three years to perhaps every three to four years. And that's not because the technology is missing. It's be, it will be because our systems users of the technology don't know how to use all the technology we can provide. And so when I talk to systems designers, I kind of throw down the, the, the uh, the gauntlet and say, I don't think you can use all the technology we provide. And we're going to have to slow down. Uh, and, and, and I'm waiting for the technologists, the systems people to finally come back and use more than we have and, and get us driving again. So that's what I see in Moore's Law. If I then look at performance and say, how are we going to get more performance? The best way I know to get more performance than that is by taking advantage of Moore's Law, and that is with more transistors I can begin to do multiprocessing. And you will begin to see us using more and more systems like this where we have multiple signal processors on a device to handle all the real world signals. We will have coprocessors or system processors to handle the system problems. We will have accelerators, peripherals, everything necessary to do the solution. Uh, I was asked by an editor a year or so ago whether we would ever see a time where we would have a million microprocessors in a system. And my answer was, was pretty straightforward. I said, if we go back to the early 90s, right, or excuse me, early 50s, when the transistor had just been invented, and had we talked to one of the early designers of the transistor radio, who had just finished a six transistor design of the transistor radio and asked him or her, will you ever be designing with a million transistors? The answer would have been, you must be crazy. We could never do that. Well, now we're at a million. What Moore's Law would give us probably in the early 20, uh, uh, 2020s is billions of transistors at a very low cost. Uh, we can very well see transistor costs in the order of a billion transistors per US dollar. That's pretty cheap. And, and so we're going to have lots of opportunity to do multi-processing to solve our problem. And we will have systems with hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of processors on them. Uh, it, it'd be fun to watch that one grow and see how we do that. So that's how we will get more performance. If I look at power dissipation, 
Uh, this is something I've been driving for 20 years uh, uh, when I started yelling and screaming inside of TI and in the industry about power dissipation being an important performance metric of technology. Uh, I was mostly ignored, and at least they didn't laugh in my face. Uh, but we have found power dissipation per unit of work on our integrated circuits going down at this rate. Uh, and, and the rate, the, the green line, ends up being about half the power every 18 months. And it continues to go down. If you'll notice, uh, about 2000, we had this flat line. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But there are a couple of interesting things about this, and, and that is, if we go ahead and draw a couple more lines in, there are two things you note. One is, we're beginning to scavenge energy. Brand new technology, lots of universities working on it. We're about five or 10 years before it really works well, but the concept is there is energy in the environment that we should be taking advantage of to drive our integrated circuits. Uh, light energy, uh, all the walls in this building are vibrating. Uh, you have no choice. Uh, so you have mechanical uh, energy, uh, you have heat differentias differentiation, or diff uh, differences uh, that are going to create energy. And so you have all these ways of creating electrical energy to drive the circuits. When those two lines cross, and we, can now, we, we are able to generate enough electrical energy to do something significant, then we begin to find we don't need batteries, we don't need power inputs, we have perpetual devices. In fact, a, a new concept that we will begin to think about is energy buffering, not energy storage, but how do I buffer the energy so that the amount of energy I get from the environment and the amount of energy I need for my circuits gets buffered so that I, uh, I have the right amount at the right time. And so we will see that as a concept as we go into the future. And we will get there. I, I put the brain on there. Uh, when I started driving low power inside of TI uh, many years ago, I told our, our scientists that what I wanted things to do is run off body heat. And, and they never understood what body heat meant. And so one day I realized that we do have a processor that runs off body heat. It's called the brain. And so I did a little research and found out the amount of energy the brain uses and the amount of performance it apparently has. And it finds itself to be about, what is that, uh, a nanowatt per megamac. That's what it looks like. And so that's going to happen in the next five or 10 years. And so in the next five or 10 years, we will begin to see circuits that have the same power efficiency, not the same capability, but the same power efficiency that we we see in the human brain. Now this could be totally wrong, but it does give us an idea that uh, where we're heading. Now let me talk about the downside of integrated circuit technology, and that is that blip in the in, in about 2000 where you see the flat line. That was a result of us being blindsided in the semiconductor world because all of a sudden standby power, the leakage power of our circuits became as dominant as the active power. And once that occurred, we found that we couldn't continue to drive the low power. And as you can tell, the active power continues to go down. But we had this little time out on the, on the uh, leakage power, the uh, uh, standby power, where we didn't know what to do and it stayed flat. As you see on this chart, we're beginning to drive it down again. So we're in pretty good shape be back on the curve and be driving the, that goal of uh, the perpetual device.